Matthew chapter 10, <clears throat> beginning verse 28. Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father, but the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Therefore everyone who confesses me before man, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before man, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. This uh, scripture came to mind recently as I read an article about uh, Tim Tebow. You know Tim Tebow, the football player, backup quarterback, third or fourth backup quarterback for the New York Jets. And, uh, and, and openly practicing believer in Christ. Well, Tim Tebow was scheduled to speak at the First Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas recently. Now Tebow is a Baptist, so it's natural. You know, he was going to a, a church that was of his own denomination. And he was invited to speak at the, get this number, 11,000 member 11,000 member congregation as part of their $113 million fundraising campaign. Because they're building a new building and they're having a new campus and uh, apparently it's taken up five blocks, five city blocks. Big church building. Anyways, they invited Tim Tebow to speak, you know, part of the fundraising, part of the hoopla. But then in February, he canceled his appearance because he was criticized for agreeing to appear at that particular church alongside their preacher, and their preacher's name is Robert Jeffress. And Robert Jeffress is an outspoken critic of the gay rights movement. So Thibault, you know, he has shown remarkable poise in the past facing ridicule for his public display of faith. Young guy, he's just a young guy. All that pressure on him, you know, making fun of him because he, he wants to openly confess his faith in Jesus Christ. However, it seems that standing up to the gay lobby was just too intimidating for his public relations people, so he canceled. Such is the power of this movement in today's society, especially for those who are in the public eye. Now he could have made such an impact had he stayed the course. I wonder if he would have made the same decision had he been reminded of the story of other young men who faced similar challenges with much more than just their reputations on the line. Of course I'm referring to Daniel, the Old Testament, and his friends who faced not a PR disaster, but who faced a king's challenge and remained true to God and their faith despite the risk of death. Perhaps we can learn some important lessons from them that will help us when our time comes to stand up and stand firm for our beliefs. So I'd invite you to turn your Bibles now over to the book of Daniel. We'll be reading out of there in a while, in a minute. So the story of Daniel is set in that point of Jewish history when the original kingdom of the Israelites had been attacked, had been divided, and ultimately had been destroyed. When Joshua led the people into the promised land from the desert, they subdued the land, they established control with each of the tribes dwelling in a certain part of what is now known as Israel. With time, these tribes were formed into one kingdom under Saul, succeeded by David, succeeded by his son Solomon as kings of this united kingdom. There was peace, there was unity, until war broke out between Solomon's sons over the control of the kingdom, and this resulted in divisions into the northern kingdom, ten tribes, the southern kingdom, two tribes. In time, the northern kingdom was destroyed and only the southern kingdom remained. So our lesson today takes place when the Babylonian Empire is world ruler and threatening to take over 
the small southern kingdom of Judah. Now at this time, the southern kingdom tried to mount a revolt to break away from the grip of Babylonian power. And as a result, the Babylonian army is sent to put down this rebellion. And in 597 BC, the Babylonian army led by Nebuchadnezzar came and subdued the city. They carried away its wealth and its leading citizens, leaving only the poor and the old to maintain the land and the city. Among the young noblemen that were taken into captivity was Daniel and several of his friends. So let's read about that in Daniel chapter one, kind of situate ourselves in the Bible and situate ourselves in the story. Daniel chapter one. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the noble youths, uh, excuse me, of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect, who were good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah Shadrach, and to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> and so uh, in a subsequent invasion about a decade later, 586, the Babylonians returned to the completely destroyed city and they take into exile most of the remaining population. And it was during this time of exile that Jeremiah remained in the ruined city and prophesied of their eventual return 70 years later. And Ezekiel the prophet, he was carried off into exile with the people and he preached and he prophesied among the captive population in Babylon. So God left a, 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 someone to speak His word among the people in the land and someone to speak His word to the people who were in captivity. And Daniel and his young friends were sent to the court of the king of Babylon for special training. Now with time the people settled into their new land and life went on, but their faith that they uh, had taken for granted before, which led to this terrible um, affair, which led to this terrible destruction. This time their faith was severely tested in this pagan environment. And so the story of Daniel and his three friends shine forth as a wonderful example of how these believers stood up for God, even when they were challenged by the most powerful king in the world at that time. Now I don't have time to read the entire story and I'm pretty sure that all of you are familiar with what I'm going to be talking about, so let me just tell you the story and then we'll read key passages as we go. In chapters one and two of the book of Daniel, we read about the great king and the ruler of the then known world, Nebuchadnezzar, and a strange dream that he had. He dreamt about a statue with a head of gold and a breastplate of silver and legs of steel and so on and so forth, and it frightened him. And he said there was a stone that came out of nowhere and hit the foot of that statue, and that statue just crumbled, and that, and that stone that had hit the foot, it grew up into a mountain that filled the entire world, and he was terrified of this particular dream. Now Daniel and his friends had been trained as royal advisors and as such, Daniel is brought in to interpret the dream that the king has had about this great statue. Daniel successfully interprets the dream for the king regarding the statue and as a reward, the king appoints Dave, uh, Daniel rather, and the other three Jewish men to important positions in the kingdom. 
Now, the king, however, now he's had the answer to what his dream meant, you know, coming, kingdoms that were coming, he was the head of gold and there would be kingdoms that would come after him and so on and so forth. Now that he knows the dream, he decides to use the dream as an excuse to solidify his political power. And he builds a real statue made with gold 90 feet high and he commands all of his officials and political allies to meet before the statue and bow down to it or face death. So let's skip forward to chapter three in Daniel. Let's read a little passage there. Chapter three in Daniel, give you a chance. And so it says, Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width six cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, to you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you were to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Now you need to understand something here. From Nebuchadnezzar's point of view, this was more about politics than religion. Because at that time, for those people that lived at that time, they had many gods. You know, one more God, you know, one more God, one less God, not a big deal. One more God, sure. Especially if that God uh, was politically expedient, if you wish. If, if bowing down to this particular God said, you know, king, we're with you, we're your allies, we, we're behind you, what do you want us to do, bow down to this God? Sure, we got 50 other gods, one more, not going to hurt us. But for Daniel, however, and the three young Jewish men, however, this was a challenge that needed a courageous response. And so we read about the plot that begins to form. Again in chapter three, just keep reading, verse eight, it says, for this reason at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of a, fire, uh, a furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews among you, uh, excuse me, there are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. And so this situation is complicated enough, but to make matters worse, Jealous officials accuse Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego of not bowing down to the state and to the statue that represents the state, that represents the king. Now, they leave Daniel out of this because he's way too high up in the administration to attack for now. Let's keep reading what happens. Uh, verse 13, it says, Then Nebuchadnezzar in a rage and anger gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar responded and said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? <clears throat> 
Now if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, psaltery, and bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire, and what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands. What God is there that can deliver you? Excuse me again. This is my eighth sermon since Friday night, so. <coughs> and so the situation is complicated. But to make matters worse, these people accuse these young men of defying the king. I mean, you know, how many thousands of years ago did this happen? And what do you think the motivation here is? Well, it's just jealousy. People are people. They're just jealous. These foreigners, these foreigners have been put in charge over us. That's all it is. This is just a plot to bring down people they didn't like. It happens in your offices every day. Somebody snitches on somebody, gossip, whatever. So this is what's going on here. Let's get rid of this guy. Now I want you to note the diabolical challenge that the king makes to these young men. Basically he says, you worship the idol or you die. And then he says, I dare your God to save you. Now you have to understand in those days the generals fought the wars and the battles, but it was the gods who were credited with the victories. And usually when one army defeated another, you know, they pillaged their town, they'd go into their temples and they'd take out all of their sacred images and whatever they had and they'd bring them back to their country and they'd parade these things you know, throughout the streets of their city, their town, their capital, and then they'd put these things into their temple. And basically what they were saying was, my God is bigger than your God. Your God is nothing. Because look, your God didn't save you your God let you get defeated by me and my God. That, that's what was going on. So the Jews are fenced in with what seemed like an impossible challenge. For example, if they worship the idol, they sin. And it's the worst sin that they could do. That's one of the reasons why the Jews were in exile, because of idolatry. If they didn't worship, well then they died. And died a horrible death. If they accept the challenge, you know, he says to them, go ahead, dare your God to save you. If they do that, they tempt God. And that's a sin. And then if they say nothing and they go meekly to their death, they seem as cowards and they dishonor their people and their God. It's like, wow, there's no way out here. No good answer. It seemed like an impossible situation with insurmountable odds, but look at the way these men responded to the king's challenge. Let's keep going. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and He will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if He does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. How about that for an answer? See how they answer the impossible challenge? They say, if God wants to, he can save us. We have no doubt whatsoever that if He wants to, He can save us. So don't judge the strength of our God by our weakness. They were fully convinced of God's ability and whatever happened to them did not change who God was and what God could do. Such an important idea for us to remember when we begin judging God's love and God's ability merely on the circumstances of our lives. I'm doing good, well, God is good. I'm happy, well, God is great. I'm doing bad, bad things are happening to me, terrible things have happened to me, well, I guess God has fumbled the ball. 
I guess God is not so great after all. I guess God is not paying attention to me. I guess God doesn't love me. I guess God is this and God is that. Why? Because I'm judging Him based on what's happening to me. And not based on who He is. And who He is never changes. We change, our circumstances change, but He is the same yesterday, tell me, today and when? Tomorrow, amen. Such an important idea for us to remember when we begin judging God's love and ability merely on the circumstances of our lives. God is always more generous than our best blessing and He is always stronger than our greatest pain and our greatest failure. Another thing that we need to understand and what they said. They said whether God wants to save us or not makes no difference since we are determined not to serve your idols or your gods. Man, you know, smack you in the head. We don't care what you do. You can do whatever you want to us. You can't threaten us. You can't make us not believe. How many believers since the beginning when God revealed Himself, how many believers have said this? Go ahead, beat me up, lock me up, kill me, tear me apart. I can't deny what I know and I can't deny what I've seen. And so my faith is not based on what you're going to do to me. Whatever you do to me cannot change what is true. And that's what they were saying here. No matter who you are, you cannot make us do what is wrong. Another valuable example for us today who are under pressure to compromise what is right because doing right is unpopular or politically incorrect or inconvenient socially. You know, poor Tim Tebow, what a shot, he had a chance and he caved, he caved in. And I, I, again, I, I, I'm not you know, trying to criticize him, such a young guy under such pressure, you know, I mean, could we stand it? I'm just saying, he, he listened to the wrong guy. He listened to his PR people and his handlers and his massagers. He should have got his nose into the book. He would have found the courage to stand up for what's right. And so the balance of the chapter, verses 19 to 30, describes what happened after they made this reply to the king. Well, we know they were thrown into a hot furnace. It's actually a kiln. It was a thing they made bricks in, you know? it had to be heated up. Uh, they were saved by a fourth person appearing with them in the fire and they came out of the furnace without even their clothing smelling of smoke. And the most amazing thing is that the king, seeing this great miracle, glorifies God publicly and rewards these men for their faith. Not their courage, for their faith. The king goes from being a hater and a taunter of God to someone who openly glorifies and honors God and His servant. So where are the lessons here? Do we have a couple of lessons that we can draw from this? Surely. This event changed the king's life and it teaches us two important lessons that could change our lives as well if only we'd be willing to learn them. Lesson number one. These men had absolute faith in God's ability even though they did not know His will for their lives at that moment. How many people I know and I speak to in the church who do not know what God's will is for them at that particular moment? Even though we don't always know the details of God's plan for our lives, let's never doubt His ability to save us, to help us, to rescue us, and most importantly, to raise us from the dead. Let's never doubt that. And ultimately, of course, to raise us up from the dead, as I mentioned. Paul says, and God raised the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. That's what I believe. When I'm sick, that's what I believe. When I'm discouraged, that's what I believe when the best thing that I could think of and I try and it fails, it blows up in my face, that's what I believe. 
His ability is not based on my ability. His ability is based within Himself. In this context, let us be assured, as these people were assured, that God is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. He can do more than what we think. He can give us more than we can imagine. Let's not doubt that for a moment. And then the other lesson is this. These men were absolutely committed to obedience. Absolutely committed to obedience. These people were not just dependable, they were committed to obedience as a way of life. Their minds were made up long before as to how they would react if faced with such a situation. They knew they were going to a pagan land. And they decided before they even arrive, if we are asked, if we are forced, if we're challenged to worship an idol, right now we're deciding no. We're not going to wait till we get there. Right now we're going to decide no. So when they first arrived in Babylon, they had refused to eat the king's food. Why? Because they were committed to the principle of obeying God and as Jews they couldn't eat that food. So many problems are so easily handled. Decisions become crystal clear. Yielding to the Spirit is so effectively done when we are committed to obedience beforehand. You know, the best application of this, or one of the great applications of this, is when I was talking to our, uh, uh, our teens, our kids, you know, about uh, their sexuality young boys, young girls, growing up, full of life, full of strength, full of virility. And I would say, especially to the young people, you decide now what your answer is going to be. You decide today how you will react if you are tempted as a young man to be sexually impure. And you, young lady, you decide right now what you're going to do and how you're going to react if the boy you like or the boy you have a crush on acts in an inappropriate way with you. Don't wait till the lights are out and don't wait till you're in the car and don't wait till you're all alone and don't wait till your heart is beating fast and you're not sure. You don't wait till then to make the decision. You make the decision now. And when that moment comes, you'll know what to do. It'll be crystal clear. Your emotions will not overcome you. These young guys, they decided way ahead of time how they were going to react. And when they were challenged by the most powerful king in the world, they knew exactly how to respond. We would save ourselves so much grief and pain. We would accelerate our personal growth and growth of the church if we could decide to commit ourselves to obey God now so that when the challenge comes, we're ready. These Jewish men faced the challenge of the king in his fiery furnace and they walked away unscathed because they believed God is able, whether they were saved from death or not, they believed that He can do it if He wanted to. And they were committed to obedience, whatever the circumstances. When we hope and when we dream and when we plan, do we pray with the knowledge that God is able? When our dreams crumble and our plans and prayers go unanswered, do we lose faith in God or do we continue to honor Him no matter what? It's easy to praise and trust God when we're on the mountaintop. It's when we can trust and praise God from the bottom of the valley that we show that our faith is genuine. And finally, are we, are we truly committed to obedience? Have we already made the decision to do the Lord's will in every situation or are we still obeying when it's convenient and comfortable and making excuses for the rest of the time? I never want to hear, tell, I'm telling you now, okay? I'm, 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 I'm stating forth, I'm going on the record, I'm, I'm talking to the video, right? Do not say to me, nobody's perfect as an excuse for sin. Don't use that. You know why? Because nobody's perfect. We already know it, people. Like that's some kind of news. 
like that's some kind of real true excuse. Don't, don't use that. Get that out of your vocabulary. These men, they saved themselves and they converted their enemy because they refused to compromise right from the beginning. Our salvation and that of those in this world rests on no less a commitment to such an obedience for ourselves and for this church. So if you haven't already done so in your life, I call on you tonight to place your trust in God no matter what your life is like. It's never too late and it's never too difficult to put your trust in God. And decide today that whatever the situation in the future, your choice will be to obey God. Now for some of us here, these decisions might mean that we have to obey God's command to repent and to be baptized in order to be forgiven for our sins and to enter into the body of Christ. Or maybe the decision uh, is to be restored to God through repentance and prayer. If this is the decision that you face tonight, then I encourage you to obey God and come forward as we stand and as we sing our song of invitation. <laughs>